On Tuesday, South Korean memory chip makers Samsung and SK Hynix began halting sales to one of their biggest customers, Chinese tech firm Huawei Technologies. U.S. sanctions that took effect that day banned the supply of semiconductors made with American technology to Huawei without prior approval from Washington. But it's not as simple as cutting off supplies for the South Korean firms. Huawei is one of Samsung's five biggest customers, not only for memory chips, but also displays that include semi semiconductor technology. As for SK Hynix, Huawei accounts for around 10% of its sales. So this impact will be sizable on South Korean firms, but could it also be an opportunity as the increasing number of sanctions targeting Chinese tech firms compromise their global market share? Now to discuss this today, we connect with John A. Quelch, Dean of the University of Miami's Herbert Business School. We're also joined by Andrew Lim, Trade Commissioner at the Quebec Government Office here in Seoul. Thank you so much for joining us today. And let's start with you, Dr. Quelch. So, Huawei is one of the five biggest clients for Samsung, and it takes up about 10% of SK Hynix's um, sales, spending around uh, 8.1 billion US dollars in total for both Samsung and SK Hynix to buy D, sorry, DRAM and NAND flash memory chips every year. But first of all, why were the South Korean firms forced to really give this up? And what impact will this have on these two companies? Uh, well, the sanctions were finalized on August the 14th, and um, they make it very clear that uh, any company that is sourcing uh, chips from uh, suppliers that have used American kit to make those chips uh, will be subject to uh, sanction uh, by the U.S. Department of Commerce. And these, uh, these uh, measures uh, take effect uh, literally on September 14th as we are speaking. Um, just to answer your question regarding the importance of these products to Samsung in particular, Samsung's annual revenues are around about $220 billion. Um, so what we're talking about here in Samsung's case is around about $6 billion of revenue or about 3% of total Samsung revenues, uh, which may not seem like a lot, but it is significant in the sense that Samsung could, if it goes uh, in compliance with U.S. sanctions, which really it has no choice but to do, uh, but it is then vulnerable not only in terms of chips but in other product categories that it sells significantly into the Chinese uh, market. Um, at the moment, though, Samsung's total sales to China represent about 17% of total revenues, whereas about 25% of its total revenues come from sales into uh, the United States. SK Hynix, by the way, as being uh, a company more focused on chip production than Samsung, is uh, more dependent on the Chinese uh, semiconductor sales than Samsung is. So they're in a little bit more of a vulnerable position, in my view, than Samsung. Well, for SK Hynix especially, it's going to be a big blow. And well, Mr. Lim, we've got you back on the phone there. Um, so how can the South Korean chip makers really make up for the loss in margin? Actually, I kind of have a more of a positive aspect on the market. I'm sure you know with the fourth industrial revolution and with the so-called untapped economy, uh, we I see a lot of opportunities for chip makers because we're going digital and a lot of digital technology requires semiconductors and CPU. Uh, another aspect that I think they could kind of um, you know make up for loss in margin is perhaps diversify into kind of new markets. Of course, there's Huawei, but there's other I guess, um, phone makers such as Oppo, Xiaomi, et cetera. And perhaps they could kind of take some of the market share from there as well. And another aspect that I saw is perhaps they could invest a little bit more in their foundry technology. As I already mentioned, because a lot of the you know, current modern economy requires a lot of computing power, there will be a lot of demand for chip making. And uh, there's only several foundries that, act, that could actually produce the, the CPUs or, or chips in in large-scale amounts, so that could be another way to kind of diversify and make up for the loss in margin. Right, so it could be a chance for them to uh, really strengthen their non-memory chip businesses as well. Yes, exactly. And, well, Mr. Lim, then could this be a new opportunity for Samsung in particular, as it directly competes with Huawei in uh, various businesses? 
No, I think this is a, it's a very interesting, I guess, a phenomenon going on these days in the international world, I'm sure you know, with the sanctions and in trade wars, et cetera. So Samsung could kind of sees this, quote-unquote, kind of a political opportunity. Um, a lot of the countries around the world see Korea not only as a leader in IT technology, but they see Korea as also as kind of a this kind of safe middle power, this neutral country that tries to always kind of, quote-unquote, be friends with other countries. So by kind of leveraging that and showing the world, you know, Samsung is kind of the uh, kind of an alternative where, you know, there won't be any political ramifications. They could kind of maybe piggyback off this kind of current mood and try to see what kind of opportunities they could kind of compete with why in terms of especially 5G, but phones as well, of course. And Dr. Koch, do you also see possibly new opportunities for Samsung and maybe SK Hynix as well? Uh, well, I'm certainly very bullish on uh, South Korean technology, and I agree with uh, what Mr. Lim has said. Um, Samsung and SK Hynix uh, are both uh, formidable global uh, companies with tremendous uh, uh, quality of R&D uh, and uh, great scientists, and uh, I'm sure that they can pivot uh, with agility to be uh, discovering new product market opportunities around the world. Um, one, one thing that will happen here, I think, is that as the Chinese uh, shift to developing their own uh, production, their own chip production uh, within China, uh, that will, of course, uh, uh, be good news in a way for uh, customers around the world outside of China, because uh, the uh, competitors, Micron of the U.S., SK and uh, Samsung, uh, will be going after the non-Chinese customers with uh, extra uh, enthusiasm, and that should be good for uh, chip prices from the customer's point of view worldwide. Now, Dr. Crouch, what does this mean for Huawei? Do you think it's going to have to adjust their supply chain? And will Chinese IT firms, not only in Huawei but other companies too, will they have to rely on their homegrown technology as tensions with the United States is really set to continue? Well, at one point it was uh, thought, I think, uh, that um, various suppliers to Huawei would be able to petition the Department of Commerce uh, in the U.S. for further uh, licenses to continue to supply Huawei. Uh, but given the current political environment, that's extremely unlikely. Uh, and even if, uh, um, even if uh, former Vice President Biden uh, becomes the next president, I would not expect to see much relaxation with respect to the China policy that President Trump has put in place. So that really does require uh, that uh, the Chinese pivot towards making their own chips. And in fact, uh, over a year ago, the Chinese government declared its intent to make 70 percent of its own chips in China by the year 2025. And that, uh, that effort is well underway already. The problem is that uh, the Chinese will be playing catch up in terms of chip manufacturing, and that's definitely going to slow down Huawei for a year or two uh, in terms of its ability to provide the absolute latest uh, technology to uh, fuel its 5G and other related sales worldwide. So I think that, um, I think that you know, Huawei is definitely being uh, put on the ropes here, but um, they do have something like $53 billion in uh, cash reserves. Uh, that's enough to carry them for a year and a half in terms of their operating expenses. Uh, so uh, given the uh, speed with which uh, China can uh, move and advance in technology, uh, a year and a half should be enough time for Huawei to uh, come up to snuff in terms of its own uh, domestic chip manufacturing capability. Well, Mr. Lim, do you think China will be able to catch up um, very quickly in terms of the quality that do you think um, the company will be able to maintain the quality, um, the quality of its products? And I mean, is the local semiconductor industry good enough right now? Oh, that's actually a really good uh, big concern because um, I'm sure, you know, one of the biggest, I think, loss for China or Huawei in terms of the, the, the actual trade war and the 
all this phenomenon is that they won't be able to not only use American uh, technology to make semiconductors, which is basically everything, also they'll be losing other types of uh, technologies like Android, for example. Yes, Google has uh, it's kind of an open system Android, the, the basic version, but you know, to actually put the Android properly in Huawei's phones, that will be a huge loss for China, and also they'll be losing the Play Store, although some of the Google things are banned, but still having that ecosystem available and losing that now, I think that'll be make a huge, I guess, detrimental impact for Huawei. And yes, they do, or they are, the government is in the initiative of kind of promoting their own or encouraging their own um, R&D in terms of their semiconductor industry. But from what I could gather, they still have a lot of catch-up to do. The latest um, chip-making technology, the 7 nanometer architecture, uh, China is unable to, to produce this. There's only about two companies in the world that could actually make these kind of technologies. So if and when Huawei does come up with their own, uh, I guess, chip-making uh, uh ecosystem, it'll be, I would say, at least several years behind. And the best case scenario is maybe they could make phones that are more uh, mid-range if it's compared to other countries with full access to American technology. And Dr. Crouch, last year over 40% of Huawei's smartphone sales were actually made outside of China. Do you think um, then, would it be easy then to resume trade once U.S. tensions uh, with China are somewhat eased, or will the damage be permanent? Um, I think it's quite uh, quite likely that uh, the current tensions will linger beyond uh, the November election. Um, obviously, the rhetoric is extremely uh, high at the moment uh, in uh, the U.S., uh, with both parties really competing to uh, present themselves as tough or tougher on China than the other. Um, and I don't think that that's going to abate that quickly after the election is over. Uh, so I would uh, be very skeptical about uh, a resumption of uh, normality in U.S.-China relations. Uh, the new normal may be uh, one of continuing tension as uh, the U.S. Uh, feels um, perhaps under pressure from China in terms of uh, its economic uh, uh, superiority. I think there's also a feeling in many quarters in the U.S. Uh, that China has uh, bent the rules uh, over the last few years, and uh, uh, these measures are uh, part of an effort to slow down uh, the advance of China that has been uh, aided by, in the opinion of some people, uh, the uh, theft of U.S. and other uh, non-Chinese technology. Now, Mr. Lim, before we go, now countries like South Korea, Australia and Canada are caught in the middle of this US-China conflict. And it does seem that more and more countries are leaning towards Washington. Do you think there could be retaliation from Beijing if this pattern continues? Oh, I, I guess we could already see, you know, through the several years of kind of trade wars, etc., there has been uh, supposed retaliatory, I guess, um, actions. But what I see here more is, Retaliatory is more like the stick end, but also there's the carrot part of the international relation kind of um, work too. So I would say, you know, China would also kind of bring about their own kind of group and, you know, try to give them carrots so that they could kind of cooperate together too. One prime example is the BRI or the Belt Road Initiative. So this is kind of encouraging investment with Chinese money to other countries so that they could kind of, you know, foster this, this level of collaboration. So in the future, definitely, I think I'll see more of the world of a bipolar system where, you know, there's the one camp with the U.S. and its allies, the five eyes, et cetera. And on the other side, there will be kind of the, the China kind of group with, you know, with uh, actions such as BRI or the, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So there will be this kind of, I feel, maybe a two-group kind of bipolar system in the future where, you know, maybe some countries will, they may be able to tip the line in the middle, but then most may have to actually kind of uh, choose their sides and, and, and go from there. And one other concern I always had is China, one of their biggest, I guess, um, big concern is one of their big retaliatory concern is China produces over 90 percent of all rare earth uh, metals and materials and a lot of these advanced materials go into some of the modern technology in terms of chips to cars 
And this is kind of one um, concern that, that the international community has been having. So I think this is something we will have to watch out for in the future. Right, so really, it's again, it's not really simply a matter of cutting off supplies to China, but there are all these uh, ramifications that we have to think about. But I'm afraid this is where we'll have to wrap up the discussion. That was Dr. John A. Crouch, Dean of the University of Miami's Herbert Business School, and Andrew Lim, Trade Commissioner at the Quebec Government Office here in Seoul. Thank you so much for sharing your insight with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you so much for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Have a great day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.